Hi, everyone. People are a little bit slow to join today, so we're just going to give everyone a few minutes to get in, okay? We'll be with you shortly. All right, hi everyone. Vanessa is going to be hosting today's webinar. She is just getting signed on here. Thank you for joining. Today, she will be talking about chapter five, the discussion chapter. As she goes through the slides, you're welcome to submit your questions. Uh, we do have the question and answer functionality as well as the chat. So I'll post some notes there so you can see where you can write. And as she goes through, if you have questions that arise, you're welcome to submit your questions while she's speaking. Or if you want to wait until she's finished with the full presentation to see if she addresses what you're interested in learning more about, and then post the question at the end. Either way, we will answer all the questions before the session has ended. So if you do post in the middle of the session and she doesn't address your question right away, we will make sure that she sees it before the session ends. So I'm going to go ahead and post in the chat right now so you can all see where to post. Um, and we'll get started in just a minute. Thanks, Brittany. So Brittany will be here um, kind of just moderating and answering the questions or making sure Vanessa sees the questions as they come in. She did just post a couple of links that you're welcome to use to look at other webinars that we've had or to schedule a consultation or see our free resources. We do have a lot of free resources available at the website. Um, and like Brittany mentioned, we do send a copy of the webinar to your inbox 24 to 48 hours afterwards. With that, you will also receive a copy of the slides. And they're also posted to our website. If you don't see it in your inbox, you can visit the webinar archive on our website to find copies of any of the webinars from the past.
Hi there. Hey, Brittany, are people in? Okay. All right. Okay, uh, we're ready to get going. Uh, hi, everybody. Sorry for the delay. Sorry for the, uh, the difficulties, but um, I think we're ready to get going now. Um, welcome to the Statistics Solutions uh, webinar on Chapter 5, the discussion. Um, our, our Chapter 5 being the discussion chapter, uh, and I want to make sure everybody can hear me. If you're having sometimes, my connection is staticky. So if you have any um, trouble, just let me know so I can adjust it. Um, okay. Just a minute. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, our. The um, discussion being chapter five is based on the typical um, social sciences uh, five chapter model. Um, sometimes there are differences um, in the, in the um, number of chapters there are. Sometimes there's six chapters. Um, it just depends on the model your school uses, but this is pretty standard. Um, but whether it's chapter six or, or a different chapter, um, we are talking about the discussion wherein you discuss and you interpret the results. Um, and always going to hear me say this several times uh, throughout the presentation. Um, always get your school's template for, um, you know, for what they want in the chapters. Um, because, uh, you know, sometimes there are differences, but this is a good general um, guide that should serve you well uh, generally. But again, just sometimes schools have um, particulars uh, that they're looking for. Okay. All right, so this is what we're going to be covering today. And again, these are fairly um, typical features of a discussion chapter. Um, introduction, interpretation of the findings. Sometimes it's self-called the discussion section. Uh, limitations. Um, implications for practice, uh, recommendations for further research in the summary. Okay, so for the introduction, um, you want to, sorry, working from home, got to, okay, so let me see if I can turn the volume down here so it's, not as uh, so distracting. Hold on a second. Okay, that should help turn the levels down a little bit. Okay. So yeah, so for the introduction, um, the purpose here is to kind of reorient your reader um, about what you've what you've been doing and what you've done. Um, so it's helpful to restate the purpose of your study, and um, since it's your purpose, um, you can restate it verbatim. Um, you don't get to do that with anything else in your study except your purpose statement and your research questions. Um, professors do not like you to copy and paste material from different sections of your dissertation and put it somewhere else. Um, but again, for the purpose statement and for the research questions, you get a pass on that. They want those verbatim because they never change. Um, so restate the purpose of your study um, and just you know take some time to remind the reader of the importance of your study, uh, why it's been conducted or why you know why it was needed. Um, and why you conducted it. So kind of, you know, talk to them a little bit about the research problem. 
remind them of the research problem and the, the, the importance of the study. Um, and you can end by previewing contents of um, what's to come of the chapter, you know, previewing uh, the sections uh, that, that are going to um, uh, be present in the chapter. So, you know, that's just a general kind of introduction, reorient the reader about what you're doing. Um, you know, it shouldn't take longer than a solid paragraph, maybe a couple paragraphs. Okay, the interpretations of the finding section, again, sometimes it's just called discussion, which is a little confusing because it's in the discussion chapter. Um, but interpretation of the findings is pretty standard. Um, this is where you, really what you're doing here is um, people get confused sometimes and they, they don't know what to do. So they, they kind of copy and paste or they go back to their results. And um, okay, they go back to your, their results and kind of uh, restate those. But what you want to do here is um, lay out your findings. And, and a good way to organize this, let me back up just a tad. Um, a good way to organize this is to um, make subheaders. So organize a section based on if, you're, if you're your study is quantitative, um, use research questions as subheaders. If it's qualitative, you can use your themes as subheaders, but you need to organize it because you'll get, when you start talking about your findings and you start talking about your findings in relation to previous literature, it's easy to kind of get confused and mix things up. Um, so this helps you as a writer to organize your material. It's also gonna be reader friendly. So make uh, subheaders, again, if it's quantitative based on your RQs, if it's qualitative based on your themes, um, restate, you can, you can restate your, your research questions here um, if it helps. Um, so for RQ1, for example, you can restate it. Um, summarize your finding, right? What you found in very plain spoken terms. Um, you can use statistics, but this is not a statistics heavy chapter. Uh, the statistics are back in the results. So you don't need a lot of statistics. Um, summarize your, your finding for RQ1 and then, or your themes, it's qualitative. Um, and then the, the big piece here is to talk about your finding in relation to the findings, the major findings of previous literature. And this involves you going back a little bit to chapter two, um, where you have, you know, reviewed uh, previous literature. So it's important to note whether your findings support previous literature, whether they, they do not support previous literature, or um, whether they add something new, which is important to, to note as well. Um, sometimes findings are mixed on a topic, right? Um, you know, Smith found one thing, but Jones found something else. If that's the case, then you just need to say that findings are mixed and then your, you know, relate your findings uh, among those other ones, noting which findings it supports and which findings uh, it doesn't. Um, if your findings don't support previous literature, um, it's customary to um, give a, some kind of explanation. Um, sometimes this can be, you know, have to do with your setting. It could have to do with your sample. Um, you know, you, you studied a different sample of individuals than, you know, previous researchers did. So they may have had, you know, um, that could have, um, you know, you're, the findings of uh, not supporting the previous literature could have been attributable to that. Um, sometimes limitations affect uh, results. Um, and then you can make conclusions based on your findings and your discussion of your findings in relation to previous literature. So for example, if your findings um, corroborate or support major findings from previous research, um, you can make a pretty solid conclusion based on that because previous research says something and your findings support that. Um, therefore, you can conclude that whatever that was that you were, you were looking at, um, you can make conclusions based on that. Um, if your findings don't support previous literature, then um, that suggests a degree of inconclusiveness, right? Because the findings show one thing, but your findings show something else. Um, 
that suggests that maybe more research is needed, right? That um, things are still kind of up in the air, things are still mixed. And if your findings don't um, turn out the way you expected, or if they don't support previous research, that's completely fine. I have people sometimes say, um, oh my God, you know, it, it doesn't support previous research or it's not what I expected. It, it's fine. Um, you're a researcher, you're supposed to be approaching this objectively um, and the findings are what they are. Vanessa, can, can you take, sorry, can you, um, you screen sharing with me? Let me see, exit, okay. Take that off my screen. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I can see the other stuff. All right. So yeah, you, you need to, your findings are what they are. Um, you know, you, you, you get what you get, um, you approach them objectively. And even if they don't support previous research, research, they still tell us something, right? Um, so if they don't, right, it suggests inconclusiveness and you can pick back up on that inconclusiveness um, later when you talk about recommendations for further research. And so do this for what I just explained to for each research question. It's qualitative, do it for research question number two, research question number three, however many you have. If it's qualitative and you have themes, do it for each theme. Okay, and that's the idea for that section. So interpretation, it's not just some people think interpretation, great, I get to say whatever I want. Well, not really. Um, you do have to make that, um, that discuss, set up that discussion of your findings as they relate to previous research. Okay, usually next comes the limitations. Um, sometimes limitations is its own section. Sometimes you can just fold the limitations into the end of the discussion section. Um, just check your, your template to see if um, your school prefers one or the other. Um, but limitations are any shortcomings or weaknesses, um, things that may have affected your results. Okay, so, um, you know, a big limitation for quantitative studies is that your sample was too small. So um, you usually do a power analysis um, to determine how many participants you needed to reach um, a level uh, where you can have statistical certainty. If you need, say, 100 participants, but you get 75, that means your study is underpowered. Um, that will affect your results. Okay, that's a limitation. Um, it's not bad. It doesn't mean everything, you have to throw everything out. It just means you have to note it as a limitation because it could potentially affect um, your findings. Um, limitations, I mean, we're still dealing with COVID to some degree in different ways. Um, you know, that could have thrown a, a wrench in the gear of your study, you know, like um, you could have presented some challenges or some limitations. Maybe you couldn't get access to the population that you wanted uh, and you had to use a proxy uh, sample, um, something like that. Uh, for qualitative studies, um, you know, researcher bias is always kind of a, a potential limitation, like you're too close to the subject. Um, or maybe you work in the area and you know you already have some preconceived notions. Um, and if that's the case, you just want to admit it, but then you, you also want to um, discuss a little bit about the strategies that you use to mitigate or prevent that researcher bias. And there are ways to do that. Um, you should probably check those out. Um, and usually they want you to discuss the generalizability of your results to the larger population. Uh, the larger study population. So this means, you know, how well will, will what you found transfer or generalize uh, to the larger study population? If your certain things affect this, if your study is quantitative and you met your sample size, um, chances are your, your findings should generalize pretty well. Um, but your, your recruiting strategy also affects this um, with random sampling, um, giving you the most likelihood for generalizability. Things like convenience sampling, um, which is based on, you know, you, you, you rec recruited these people because you knew them or it was easy or they knew somebody. Um, 
that kind of reduces your generalizability a bit. Uh, for qualitative studies, um, it's a little tricky because your, your study is not meant to give you generalizable results. Um, you have a low sample size typically um, by design and by necessity, um, you know, because you're doing interviews, hour long interviews, you know, in depth interviews, you want to get in depth information. Um, you know, you can't, you can't interview 80 people. So you're probably interviewing like 10, 12, um, maybe 15. Um, so your sample size is low, it's not representative. Um, but that's the trade off with qualitative research that you should probably just mention that um, because of the low sample size by design by necessity that um, your findings won't generalize well but that is expected and the, the trade-off is that you get the in-depth information that quantitative studies can't get um, now that doesn't mean that you know the study can still provide insight of course because that's why you're doing it um, and if you've kind of left an audit trail or kind of um, trace your steps really well uh, in, in what you're doing in like chapter three, your methods, um, you can say that, you know, you've, you've, you've done that so well that if somebody wanted to kind of replicate it, they could and use your design and your processes, they could. Okay, implications for practice. I mean, this is just like it sounds. Um, you know, there's a reason why studies are conducted and it's to get information. It's to get valuable information, right? And, and how is the information valuable or significant? Um, because it can inform practice and it can inform research. So, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so implications for practice, yeah, just like it sounds, what does the information or the data that you got what does it mean for practice? What is it, how can it inform people at that level um, in your field um, about what they do and how they do it? So if you're, um, say you're, you've conducted a, an education study, um, how can the data that you got, the information that you got, I mean, it might um, be important to teachers, right? It might be important to administrators. Um, so, and you can get kind of nuts and bolts here. You know, you know, what does it tell them? Does it tell, tell them, you know, what things to teach or, you know, better approaches to teaching or maybe what administrators should focus on and even like um, how to disseminate that, that knowledge. Like, you know, should it be disseminated through like professional development seminars or webinars or, um, you know, presentations? How, how does that get, how do these people get the information uh, to the people who are, who are affected? Um, so implications for practice, you know, you can be specific and really nuts and bolts here. Um, but just remember, they're not general implications for practice, right? Um, and they're specific, they're, they're specific to what you found. Okay. Uh, recommendations for further research. Um, so this is, uh, you know, what you recommend uh, for researchers moving forward based on what you found, based on your conclusions, even based on your limitations. Um, so the recommendations, again, these are not general recommendations. They're based on your findings. So, um, and they can sometimes be based on limitations. But findings that are novel or new um, or unexpected, you can definitely recommend more research on, on that. Um, findings that are inconclusive, like your findings did not support previous research. Um, that can be an area for further research as well, because if there's still mixed findings, if there's still inconclusiveness, um, you know, we still need further evidence. Um, so you can make uh, recommendations for research based on that. Um, recommendations can sometimes be based on limitations. And the idea here is, um, you know, do the same study, just replicate it, but address the limitations that were in my study that may have affected my results. So, um, for example, quantitative study, if your study was underpowered, 
um, you can recommend the same study just to make sure that um, researchers in the future, you know, address that and, and ensure they, they get a, um, an ample sample. Um, you can also recommend different types of studies, uh, different types of designs, so that you can get different kinds of information. Um, so if you do that, yes, yeah, say a little bit about what these other kinds of studies and these other designs will get that's, that's needed and valuable. So um, if you conducted a, a quantitative study and you found a correlation between two factors, uh, which is important, um, but you want to dig into you know know more about that relationship. You know you want to get between those things. Um, you want to kind of dig into it more. You can recommend qualitative research on that. Um, you know qualitative research. Um, you know with interviews with you know digging into um, digging into it a little more, finding out more about it. Um, you can also recommend um, things like case studies. Case studies have multiple data sources. Um, so case studies are very good for understanding a topic or a phenomenon um, comprehensively, right? Because you have multiple data sources. You can have interviews, observations. You, know, you may have a survey component, a quantitative component. Um, so if you wanted to understand something more holistically and comprehensively, you could recommend um, case studies. Um, you know, if you conducted a qualitative study and you wanted to understand um, something more kind of concretely and specifically, you could recommend quantitative studies. Um, and you can also recommend something that's called a longitudinal study. And this is um, a kind of study that has a co um, data collection points spread out over time. And um, these are good to study things like processes. Right, or things that are dynamic that might change over time. Um, so just, just an idea that you can recommend different types of research, but if you do that, just kind of say a little bit about what this would, would add if, if folks were to conduct those kinds of studies in the future. Okay, and a summary, check your um, school's template. Again, um, some schools want a summary or a conclusion. Some schools um, let you end at the recommendations for further research. Um, since this is the summary of your entire study and not just a chapter, it's a little different than the summaries of the previous chapters. So you wanna recap major points from the chapter, um, just like a summary from another chapter, but you also want to leave your reader with a take home message um, about your study, You know, leave them with the most important things about your study you want them to remember. Um, and, you know, and that, that's it. I mean, uh, so the summary, you know, a tight summary, probably a couple paragraphs or a couple good paragraphs. Um, you don't, don't bring anything new into the summary, um, you know, new, new ideas or anything. Typically you don't need um, sources in the summary. Uh, and so for the length, oh, here, before I get there, you can be looking at this. Um, this is who we are. This is what we do. Um, and we have multiple ways to contact us if you're interested in um, inquiring about uh, the services we offer. Okay. Um, yeah, so the length uh, typically for a chapter five or a discussion chapter, um, again, if your school has any requirements, you wanna follow those, but um, for a quantitative, chapter five or, or discussion, 10 to 15 pages, you know, 12 pages being about the sweet spot, but yeah, 10 to 15. Um, same for a qualitative, but qualitatives can be a little longer um, because the discussion of themes will, will likely um, make the chapter a little longer. And you can have, you know, some people sometimes, you know, have six, seven, eight themes, you know, you, you should discuss them all. Um, so that could push um, a qualitative chapter, uh, discussion chapter a little longer, you know, to, to 15, 20 pages, maybe. Um, but, but that's the general kind of um, general parameters that I've seen for the discussion chapters. Okay, uh, let me see. Are there any questions? 
Uh, if you have a question, you can um, just pop it in the um, question and answer box or the chat box, either one. And uh, I'll try my best to, to answer it for you. No questions? Okay, if there's no questions, I am, uh, again, sorry about, oh, let's see, okay, we have one here. Do you have any suggestions for mixed methods discussion chapters? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, sometimes um, mixed methods, um, the, the real, you know, the only real difference um, for the mixed methods would be everything else would, would be this section, the interpretation of the findings. Um, usually, not always, but usually um, the mixed methods that we see a lot are, it has a um, heavy um, quantitative component and then usually has, um, you know, kind of a supplementary qualitative component to kind of help explain um, what's going on in the quant or even vice versa. You have a heavy qualitative component and then maybe a short survey um, to, to ask some more pointed questions that's uh, designed to support the, the qualitative portion. Um, you can take it separately. I mean, it, it kind of depends on, on how it makes sense because all studies are different. Um, so if you, you have your, for example, if your, your study is, is, is heavy on one component and the other component is just kind of um, to act as a supplement or, or kind of give more information on, on the major component. Um, just focus mostly on that major component. And then you can bring in, you know, the, the major portion if it's quantitative, and then you can bring in um, some, some of the qualitative insights as necessary kind of fold those into the overall discussion um, where that makes sense. Now, if you've, you've conducted a mixed methods and, you, you know, you, the portions are you're kind of, you know, weighted equally, uh, you might need to have two um, separate sections, uh, discussions, discussion, discussion for the, the quantitative portion, discussion for the qualitative portion, and probably then some kind of um, synthesizing section where you kind of, you know, talk about the uh, findings in relation to one another. But again, it, it's kind of, um, it, it kind of depends on your study. I know that's, that's a little hedgy, but um, uh, yeah, sometimes though, like if it's it, one portion takes more precedent over the other, you can just kind of fold the, um, the lesser portion findings into the discussion of the major portion to kind of help support those, if that makes sense. Great. Okay. Um, any other any other questions about the discussion? Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you for coming. Sorry about the the uh, starting a little late and the technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, remember, we do run other um, webinars on other chapters and other topics, uh, including methods. Um, so be sure to check our calendars and. Um, you know, see if, if something else uh, stands out that you need. Okay, I'm going to wish everybody a, a great rest of your day. Thank you for coming and uh, good luck. Thank you.